Eureka. 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 So, good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone. Today we are having uh, a guest speaker. Thank you, Amir Gohar, for coming to join us today. Um, I will just introduce you. So, our guest is graduated from four universities, Cairo, Rotterdam, Oxford, and Berkeley. He's expert in urban planning, urban design, land use management, landscape planning, with an emphasis on tourism. Uh, some of the publications, the most important, uh, for important publications are in tourism and urbanism and tourism governance. He's actually professor at the West England, um, West of England University. So Amir, floor is yours and thank you for joining us today. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, so today we'll talk about tourism and urbanism. We'll go through... Um, questioning some tourism concepts that I think is, are very important when we deal with tourism within urban areas or open landscapes. And then we'll go through the journey of um, how tourism and urbanism have impacted each other through time. And we'll end with some considerations and recommendations for urban tourism in cities. So three parts do not look for the first while connected, but they are extremely relevant. Um, Two things I want to mention about uh, myself before I start questioning the tourism concepts that I've been immersed in tourism as a hobby long ago before I studied it. Um, so I was a scout leader in the 80s, I was in the support desert in the 90s, the, the rally, and um, I'm an advanced scuba water diver. So I also cover the marine side of national parks. And I worked a lot with the rangers and one of the Things that I also benefited a lot from is a trip from Cairo to London by car, which I've been through different cities and rural areas and borders and open landscapes by Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, Austria, Belgium, France, and the UK. Um, this is a quick map that shows the span of uh, areas I visited for academic research and teaching or public talks or professional projects or other reasons. So if you are from any of these uh, cities and you have a question or a specific projections of what I'm going to talk about, feel free to um, record that and ask me. Um, before I start, I would like to share with you that I've been puzzled a lot with all the types of tourism that are there. And I find that anything could be a tourism. It, it, it's, there is philanthropic tourism, cultural tourism, ecotourism, wine tourism, food tourism, religious tourism, mass tourism. So as someone who is concerned with the spatial arrangements or um, things that are land related, I looked at the three types that uh, are defined by their spatial arrangements. So ecotourism or sustainable tourism or mass tourism, because part of our judgment on those is how many rooms, density, footprint, tents, camp, hotel, high tower. So these are the three main things which are I'm not gonna go deeper into those, but I wanted you to have um, a critical lens on what are these. Tourism actually suffers from so many definitions that prevent from understanding it and suffers from so many classification that makes it difficult to understand such as ecotourism, sustainable tourism and mass tourism. So what are these? According to the Ecotourism Society, ecotourism is responsible for travel to natural areas that uh, conserve the environment, sustain the well-being of the local people and involves the interpretation and education. Sounds like a very good definition. Let's move to sustainable tourism. So the UNWTO defines sustainable tourism as tourism that takes full accommodation, full account of its current and future economic, social, and environmental impacts, addressing the needs of visitors, the industry, the environment, and the host communities. If you think in depth, is there any difference in the definition? And if there is, what are these? Um, then we come to mass tourism that everyone hates, that to date I couldn't find what is it. We all hate mass tourism and it creates a lot of impact on our cities. And there's no line or threshold where we can say, oh, 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 wait, you've crossed the line. Now you're mass tourism, but below that line, you are sustainable tourism or a different kind of tourism. 
Um, so I'm going to go through a few unpacking some of the complexities of these. Um, so some scholars think uh, or argue that footprint is one of the things that dictate what are these three definitions. So on a continuum where you have a very high dense footprint on the right, which comes mass tourism and ecotourism, which is a very low kind of footprint, like because when we say ecotourism, what comes to our mind is camps, tents, so something very light, not high density and probably in the wild. This could, this stream of thought uh, puts sustainable tourism a little bit greener than or on the left of masters, because it's just very similar to masters, but applying more environmental management systems. Like when you go in the room, you have the card for, to, to get the power in your room, or you don't wash your bath towel every day. There are all these good, good pressed solar heaters for the waters. Um, there are these you, to use the resources a bit wise, but it's still a 300 room in the middle of uh, similar to mass tourism, it's still a big hotel. So it has a little bit less of a footprint. Then comes another stream of tourism, host, because tourism is also studied on top business, anthropology, social science. So they define uh, that ecotourism is on one edge based on a supply demand metric. So ecotourism respond to a specific demand if there are big five in Africa or lions or reserves of tigers in Asia and you want to view those, so there's a demand to go there. So the developer would go and build an ecotourism or an ecolodge or an eco facility that allows you to enjoy that. While uh, mass tourism and sustainable tourism comes on the other spectrum of the supply level where they themselves become part of the attraction. So you go to the hotel because of the swimming pool and the spa and the buffet and the relaxed environment to do some walks in the cities. The, um, the third kind of continuums uh, puts mass tourism on poor environmental management versus good environmental management. And here some scholars put sustainable tourism actually on the far left, even more than ecotourism, especially when they come with strong environmental corporate policy. And I have specific experience having been around in many places where that is actually the case where there is a moving pick in a, in on the on the Red Sea shore that plays a strong role in protecting the shore the deep water access the coral reef and some of the mangrove trees in uh, in a place where um, the local environmental laws and policies are very weak and there's no law enforcement. So sometimes the corporate policy becomes stronger than the state law. Um, in the Red Sea area where my, not part of this talk, but when my project is, the first model applies more. And there's a part of my publications argue that ecotourism is a self-labeled industry and there's not even a specific criteria, no matter how there are green stars around the world and there's a lot of claims of having um, stars for normal tourism and green stars for ecotourism, but still a threshold where you cross or don't cross become ecotourism is not fully defined. I would like also to encourage you to question some of the some of these um, concepts that we tend to believe in and prov ad advocate for. So. So this diagram on the left shows all sorts of development in this maroon. Then we have sustainable development in purple. Tourism comes in this green or turquoise and the, and the intersection is sustainable tourism development. Um, that takes me also to the conflict that pro of sustainability that you guys probably all know. We all know that triangle uh, of the three E's, ecology, equity, and uh, economy. Uh, but I would like to, I've experienced through my many years of experience in planning for tourism, a lot of these conflicts. So the property conflict would be the rise, rises from the competing claims on and use of uh, property, such as between the tourism authority and the developer or the landowner and the hotel management or gentrifying professionals who move there to work and in long term and influence long term community by raising the land values. So this uh, growth equity conflict is uh, further complicated because each side not only resists the other, but they also need the other for their survival. 
Then we have between equity and environmental protection, we have the development conflict, which is coming from how to increase social equity and protect the environment simultaneously. Um, how could those in the bottom of society find greater economic opportunity if environmental protection mandates diminished economic growth? So if you think of a national park and you think of um, tour, local tour guides, it's in their best interest that there's more tourism so they can take foreigners around in the national park or walks in historic cities. But if, if, if that is limited for the, for the sake of cultural and environmental protection, then that's an inherited uh, conflict. The third one is the resource conflict, which is um, which happens because business resists. So think of a developer who wants to own a land to win a result. Business resists the regulation of its exploitation of nature, but at the same time needs regulation to conserve those resources for uh, present and future uh, demands. So these three conflicts always come to mind when you are uh, trying to explore tourism in a scholarly way or actually practicing because you fall in one of the, you're either a private sector, you're hired by a developer, you're a city planner with a council, you're, so we always come across these and I would encourage you to keep questioning those. One of the, um, one of the challenges I've also come across when, when looking at tourism, that it's been studied in schools in so many different branches. They are studied under hospitality and leisure. They are studied under forestry. They studied under history. You can study tourism under business. You can study tourism and cultural geography. You can study tourism under international studies. You can study tourism under anthropology and landscape and urbanism. And I think that's the part I am um, specialized in. But uh, at the same time, the more I go to the other islands or these silos, the more I understand about tourism and how it impact uh, our world and our cities. Um, that was just a, a quick um, overview to encourage you to question what you read and question what you're told and you question what the, all the international organizations trying to um, tell us. Part two goes a little bit into the um, history and evolution of the concepts and how they shaped each other. Um, although the urbanization process has been well documented throughout history and the evolution of travel has been studied with equal thoroughness. So there are people who studied these two streams a lot better than me. The connection between these two phenomena are, is significantly understudied. So I drew that timeline from 1800 to 2010 and uh, looked at the evolutions. You can put so many different eras, but I'd simplify that into the pre-industrial revolution, then the industrial revolution from 1820 to 1920, then the beginning of ecological planning when they started to focus on rivers, cleanup, and um, natural resources, then environmental mitigation from 1970 to 1980s, and then sustainable development and global environmental issues, which is the MDGs, and then 2000 onward is the SDGs and what we're living now in terms of global international uh, challenges. In parallel to that, from the very beginning to the 1800s was the aristocrats and class-based tourism. So these guys traveled, um, tourism was limited to the very elite. And this is in the pre-industrial revolution and the very first part. Then um, starting from the 70s, there was this attempt to get in close to nature and Club Med was found. And it was an, a little bit of an anti-aristocrat when it became a little bit affordable for middle class to travel and go to beaches and enjoy. Uh, Self-improving and learning while on vacation. Here, these are the kind of the travels you would do and volunteer in national parks in Central Africa or South America. Then comes adventure tourism. And that's also not limited to the aristocrats. And it happens with more awareness of the environment, and that includes hiking, game watching, etc. The last part is the solidarity and helping people here when you also volunteer and donate to help a reserve to preserve wildlife or um, nursery trees somewhere or protect or contribute to protecting the Amazons, watershed, etc. Um, so as I said, people when they study urban issues, they study city transformation, land use, historic evolution, transit, suburbs, land value, 
land tenure, streetscape, city resorts, densities, public space. These are the focus of people who study urban issues. While people who study tourism issues think of or focus on evolution of tourism, class-based tourism, socioeconomics, union, labor, institutions, business, uh, guest host encounter, staged authenticity, commodification of culture, and nature, consumption for tourism, and attitudes of locals toward visitors. So these are all topics that are explored by social scientists and, uh, and also uh, anthropologists. But when we overlap both, I started to think as also as a planner, think about destinations and tourists and, and travel mode. So these tourists travel to certain to destinations and these destinations are within cities or parks or cultural sites. So not every, not every part of our built environment or city is a destination, but uh, our the destinations that tourists go to fall within our cities. Tourists are also people, they have their needs, they have their own pressure infrastructure, they have, so they are part of, they become, when they come and visit our cities, they become part of us or become part of the, they become as well users. And I also started to look at travel mode, how do people travel and who's traveling for tourism and not traveling for tourism and how these infrastructure and connections that probably built for different reasons and purposes have also encouraged and made tourism more smooth. So this is a very conceptual saying, we have the city and the mobility and the people, and we're gonna look how these become or influence the destinations or the travel mode or the tourist. So whenever you see a D, it's the destination, which is the tourist destination, resort, hotel, camp, et cetera. I'm gonna use this diagram saying TM, meaning travel modality, which is railway, charter flight, car, bus, et cetera. And T, I mean tourist. So I will have that diagram showing, let me use this one. So you will see that diagram in the bottom repeated in every era we're studying and see who is, which of these three is influencing tourism more. I'll have black, gray, and white, three color, just a schematic way coloring these based on which is more the leading factor in each era. Um, these are the evolution of, um, the tourist eras. So we have the ancient civilizations, and then we have the Roman road, the Roman empire, where there is a Roman road network, the Grimmage era, Grand Tour, then the invention of the railway and how it structured things. And then we have the commercial car, then we have World War I, II, and then we have the beginning of ecotourism, 83, and then the solidarity and philanthropy tourism, as I mentioned earlier. So these are the different eras that I'm gonna go through each of them. And I'll give an example of some projections on Egypt because I've studied Egypt uh, thoroughly and it actually has uh, example of uh, as, a, as a very ancient tourism destination uh, of each of these eras. So in the ancient civilization 4,500 BC, there was more um, curiosity by the tourists or the visitors to roam around using the available travel mode and the destination was not, um, they were roaming around randomly trying to find resources and settle. And one of the result of that is the to find the, to settle within the Egyptian civilization and build such a grand kind of civilization that lasts up to our day today. Moving on in history, my second era I'm gonna talk about is the Roman empire where the Roman road network have facilitated the curiosity of tourists. So here, the travel mode or the infrastructure have helped people to move. So that's why it's darker, it's black. And then secondary to it comes the tourist uh, curiosity because the, the main purpose for the, uh, for the Roman roads are more to serve the soldiers and the empire to expand and trade exchange and military movement. So it wasn't built for tourists, but tourists or those who travel for curiosity uh, were able to use them. And this is a, just an example of Egypt. As I always said, I'm gonna bring Egypt as an example. So during the Roman empire, there was a, the Silk Road or the trade route from China and India coming down into the, in the Indian Ocean across to inside the Red Sea. And before the Suez Canal, Boats would anchor on the Red Sea here and on a caravan of camels, donkeys, and elephants. 
would um, go on what is called now the Roman road to the Nile and then unload again into waiting boats that sail north to the to South Europe so they can go to Italy, Spain, Portugal and even the UK. The entire route was in water except that red part. That's why we see here on the right some of the remains from the Roman um, structures and Roman uh, Roman Empire. Um, yeah, that's another just showing how the boats would come and anchor into the Egypt. And it's, a, it's called the Berenice, um, a settlement called Berenice, where they are able to anchor here because it has a shelter from the northeast current on the Red Sea. And then they, and, and that Ras is called the Ras Benes, Bernice is South Ras Benes. And then, uh, as in this map, they would go through the eastern desert of Egypt and then they sail north to the Mediterranean. The third layer of, or the third era I'm talking about here is 1200 AD, which is uh, the pilgrimage era. And here the destination was way more important than the travel mode. Everyone wants to go there for holy purposes. So the destination was the main driver for the curiosity of tourists or visitors to, uh, to go there. And um, another interesting example of that is people from all North Africa coming all the way to the Red Sea, cross to go to Mecca. And during this era, all those who passed away during this journey have been buried in places like Sheikh Salem, Sheikh Amira, Sheikh Shazli, they're all Sufi leaders of different Islamic sects, leaders that became a visitation for their followers or the same sect after that. And settlements started to grow around them as we see in the bottom here. So this was just a shrine. Sheikh Shazli is a Sufi leader who wanted to be buried in an area in 1300, an area where there are no sins committed, a very clean land. So his students just buried him in Humaythera area and this become a village with time and with the destination people would go and visit but they're not necessarily all go back so the government started to convert it to a village and put the infrastructure and the basic urban service into the area so a village was formed and it continues growing um the era of the grand tour 1660 starts by the where um young uh, European, when they reach a level of maturity, they become more matured when they travel to different destinations, regardless of the travel mode. So it's become more of a learning journey where they go and explore different cities, different areas, and learn and read about different kinds of sciences and philosophy and social studies. So they become mature men when they come back. They are more experienced and they're ready to start their life. Um, I found a lot of interesting accounts in Egypt by people coming from Britain and also from France to, um, to, to own estates around here so they can send, they can, that becomes their summer despite the distance from Europe, but they had, they owned estates here and they will be able to send their kids or family or as of course the journey is very long, but that's how they started to own places there. 1820, um, the uh, Industrial Revolution happened and the railroad happened. And that was a very significant change because it managed to take curiosities of or tourists or middle class to anywhere they want to go. So it played a vital role in tourism boom and that affected a lot their uh, the destination. And I think um, you all, all know that uh, diagram. So how elite used to live in the city center, then the city center gets congested. And then so the elite moved out using railway and that this encouraged the development of the suburbs. So railway kind of supported the decentralization of the cities and this transformed what we call a village to be a suburb. These are some examples of uh, railways from Egypt in that time. So on the left here, it's this wagon uh, a new service between Luxor and Aswan. So some of the trips were on boat, some of the trips were the railway. Is not necessarily at the beginning. It's not that railway is connected each and every area, but that's how it started. And that was also the boom of Thomas Cook. We all know uh, the famous Thomas Cook company, and it started to, to bring people from England and from Europe to uh, Egypt and also Sudan. And some by railway and some 
So Cairo as one or Alexandria, Cairo as one was the boat. And then from uh, as one to, to Sudan was a railway. So a different segments. And these are the kind of a price list. Can you imagine that for 70 pounds? You can go two weeks voyage to Luxor and Aswan for 56 pounds. Uh, it's very <laughs> amazing. And it was also um, uh, well recorded using the, um, the postal, the Egyptian postal in 1852 had a railway as well. Moving into the um, car invention, when the car became available for the public, that uh, commercial automobile era, uh, it influenced tourism and people's curiosity and land use changes at the destinations. Um, it allowed people to go out for a day use and, and to picnic. And that allows for, I'm not gonna say Airbnb, but similar kind of bed and breakfast around suburbs of some cities in Europe. Uh, this is Prince Aziz Hassan Fred Didion car at the base of the pyramids. This is from 1904. Then uh, moving to 1920, the British Empire, where um, the three pillars played parallel roles. So I kept them all gray here and influencing the built environment during this era. Um, everything was. The, the, the British Empire covered the entire, mostly the entire globe. But during this time, um, there was started to be influence on in the city like Hotel Sicily in Alexandria was built. There's a little bit of an um, influence from, it's not necessarily a copy of the British hotels, but that influence started to happen. Also the, to the right here, you have the Cairo main station. So the railway and um, colonial time brought in a lot of influence on how cities are shaped and how architecture is being formed. And these are examples of poster promoting tourism in this era, looking at um, the, the, the local server and the foreigner tourists looking at the Nile. So these are um, posters that represent that area. Moving on to World War II, the jet era. So it wasn't yet commercial, but the but after the World War II, when the commercial jet era travel, that changed tourism dynamics because everyone, not everyone, many people will be able to take that uh, flight, not, even if it's not necessarily the entire way, but it actually opened new doors for people to, uh, to travel and it shortened the trip a lot. So the jet has shortened the trip because it took tourists part of the trip, then uh, they will continue by other, other tourism cruises. Um, this is a picture of Latifa Nadi, who shows the first Egyptian woman, as well as the first uh, woman from the Arab world and Africa to earn pilot's license. 1983, specifically 83, because that is when the ecotourism was coined by Hector Ceballos, if you know about him. And here the destination become more important. Uh, people would go and enjoy nature or nature-based tourism just to go, no matter where, you, they are, they will go to, if they are, have curiosity to find camps in wild Africa or wild the Amazon, they will go from anywhere. So these camps and these trails have been shaped to accommodate for uh, the tourism demand to see specific nature-based destination. Um, these are probably one of the two, although despite all my criticism for my personal, views of ecotourism. These are two examples of two close, nearly ecologies in Egypt, and they are built after the, um, after the peace accord with Israel, um, when the borders uh, become a little bit more um, open for tourism and developers. So this is south of Marsa Alam. Uh, sorry, that specific one is north of 23 kilometers north of Marsa Alam. It's called Marsa Shogra. And it has all these tents and some of the brick built on the top here. This is a flood plain and this gentleman or developer lives where I took the picture from. And we can see that he respected the flood plain. He only kept the tents, which can be removed when it rains or the flood comes, but he built on a higher ground. Here on the left, we have Basata, meaning simplicity. And it's a... Uh, it's a very well-known um, eco place where you can enjoy being close to nature and most of their practices, if not all, is very environmental friendly. 
Uh, moving on to solidarity and philanthropy, and here where tourists or visitors become more engaged in trying to help the poor in the destination and the philanthropic tourism takes people to remote areas and trying to make a change. These are examples of, these are pictures I took that uh, trying to help local community build their own crafts or get the solid waste um, administrated or managed through this solid waste facility that comes out of tourism or hotels or heritage protection projects by introducing that column you see in the middle was introduced in 2005 for this Roman temple. I was there in 2001 and two and three and four and it wasn't there. And um, I worked in this area a lot and I've, I did not see them building that column, but I've took pictures right after it was introduced and this one as well. So looking at all the dark grabs I shared with you, this is just how the past have worked. And it helps us offering um, seeing a critical view and trying to see how the dynamics between these three pillars have played a role. Observations on how the development across each era has influenced the built environment directly or indirectly would help us also to look at the future and speculate. Um, so the three pillars, are just quick concluding remarks, three pillars, including tourism, um, of tourism, destination travel mode and tourists work together interchangeably. It's not like one influenced the other directly. It's, it's very fluid process that I oversimplified when I did my three charts. Uh, global and local tourism are also largely impacted by other non-touristic factors like war, trade, and industry. Egypt, with its particular geography, location, uh, resources, and context, has witnessed each stage of those because just of the location and the resources and the history. Um, there, there has constantly been urbanization around tourism attraction and modes of transportation, and Egypt experienced this fluid synergy between the three modalities. We need more future research that investigate this interlocking connections and how these will play a role in the future. Um, further, the investigation is needed to discern how one of the pillar becomes the primary influence. And so these are also open for criticism or changes. The more we unpack and understand our history, the more we're able to uh, challenge even our own selves. Understanding of this change of the pillars through history allows us to predict the impact of new technologies, transpiration, and tourist curiosities that may emerge on tourism development patterns from shapes and trends. I'll move now to the third part of today's uh, presentation, which is about urban tourism considerations and recommendations. That's a shorter part. Um, we'll start with the considerations. Um, the first one is that we all know, according to the United Nations, 2015, 54% of the world's population lived in urban areas. And by 2030, it's going to be 60%. So if you're interested in cities, you need to take into account tourism. And if you are interested in tourism, you need to understand how cities work. Alongside this rapid urbanization, the growth of the tourism sector in recent years, uh, driven by affordable transport, increased mobility, we all know that we definitely travel more than our parents did, and our parents traveled more than our grandparents. So these are influencing a lot of, um, and the growing of the middle class also influenced the cities and how they are shaped. And, um, may, and it also made uh, cities increasing popular uh, tourism destination. Another consideration is that the wealth generated from both domestic and international tourism contributes significantly to the socioeconomic development of many cities and their surrounding. Um, it drives cultural preservation and the regeneration of and promote intercultural exchange. While that is true, you may also argue the other way around because that cultural encounter could be positive, but it also can have some economic impacts on local and negative tribes. So the it's very important to make to bring in experience of what has been um, known and what has been taught in universities or published in uh, in books. Um, the book that uh, Samiha mentioned is called Tourism Governance, the one I'm talking about. It has a lot of these interesting unlocking these things and what work in a place might not work in another place. The growth of urban tourism also creates 
important challenges uh, in terms of the use of natural resources, environmental change, social cultural impact, fair working conditions. So it's a delicate balance that a planner or a city planner or an urbanist need to understand and also understand how tourism actually works. The fifth consideration is that in, in a time of intense debate over the growing number of tourists and the livability and sustainability of cities, it's essential that all stakeholders, residents, visitors, local, regional, and national authorities and private sector work together to respond to the current and upcoming challenges. So it's probably easy if you could get these people to sit together. So the challenge is to make stakeholders work together and then the the outcome or the process would be a lot easier. Having them all present in the same environment in the same meeting and, and, and very well represented, not heavily dominated by men or a meeting that's dominated by youngster, ignoring the senior citizens, etc. I've personally attended a lot of stakeholders meeting around the world. And I can tell you, I have not been in one with full representation of the entire stakeholder. So, it's not the tourist thing, it's just getting these people in the in the room is what uh, is a challenge. Creating policies that provide guidance to sector on how to more effectively develop and manage urban tourism is crucial to the long-term sustainability and development of tourism sector and urban settings. It's also very important to understand in that not all policies get accurately or appropriately implemented across the world. So it's not only about creating nice policies, but policies that can be influencing realities, especially in the global south, where things don't happen the way the policies dictate in general. Um, the principle of global codes of ethics for tourism. So these are the 10 ethics of tourism that I'm still reading about. And um, they are published and declared, but I have my own critique to those. I think it's very challenging it's good but challenging to have what is called global code it means we all have to believe in these uh, 10 like mutual understanding and respect between people i agree with that i probably agree with all of them but different nations and different traditional societies and different nomadic tribes have their own bylaws and have their own way of doing things that are not necessarily as global as we think uh, tourism as a vehicle for individual and collective fulfillment. I agree. Tourism, a factor of sustainable development. Tourism, a user of the cultural heritage of mankind and contributor to its enhancement. Tourism, a beneficial activity for host countries and communities. Obligations of stakeholders in tourism development, the right to tourism, liberty of tourism movement rights of the workers and entrepreneurs in the tourism industry, implementation of the principles of the global code of ethics of tourism. So these are, um, we can have like 10 lectures about each of these topics, but I just wanted to bring them here if you're interested in both cities and tourism. Uh, the recommendations are grouped into two groups. One is to promote the integration of tourism in the wider urban agenda. The second one is to foster sustainable policies and practices in urban tourism. We'll start with the first one mm -hmm. uh, to promote the integration of tourism in the wider urban agenda. So how to do that? Uh, tourism should be fully integrated in the wider city agenda as means to ensure its effective contribution to the development of inclusive, resilient, and sustainable cities. So when thinking of cities, thinking of how tourism would be incorporated or that. That's not a common practice from my experience. I've seen that happen happening in major cities that know that they are having tourism as main um, cities in France, in Spain. Um, they don't necessarily do it super well, but it is on their table. And they sometimes ask universities as think tanks to offer them advice on what are we going to do with the Euro Cup or, 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 a, or a festival or the, who runs the Eiffel Tower and who did this and who does that and how to manage it. But that's not necessarily the case with all cities where tourism doesn't play a major role or does, but probably the management or the administration of city doesn't know. 
Cities should set governance models and collaboration mechanisms for urban tourism that engage the tourism administration as well as other relevant areas at all levels. I've worked a lot in contexts where tourism is headed by the central government, by the tourism authorities, and in other countries where there's even no tourism authorities, but it's guided by local authorities that looks not only at tourism, but other things. That meandering between central versus local is not necessarily vertical. It's, it has multi facets and it requires a lot of understanding to that complexity. In fact, again, this book, Tourism Governance, answers that question and it, it maps where tourism exists in the central government of some countries like France and Turkey and Egypt and Oman and where it exists as a shared authority like tourism and fishery or tourism and agriculture or tourism in, in, in some of the Scandinavian countries and where it doesn't exist at all, which is the model of United States. That could be a standalone lecture. Why they can have it there and why tourism is led more by capital flow and private sector. But that's another, that's a third lecture. <laughs> Moving on because of time. Uh, third point is tourism should be included in cities monitoring and measurement systems, ensuring evidence-based decision-making, planning and management. I think that's that should be there regardless of tourism, but having making that distinction for tourism will allow us to plan with properly for the infrastructure and all the other pressures that tourism could generate, having all these visitors in the city in addition to their own populations. Uh, the fourth, um, the fourth one is tourism should be part of the urban policies and strategies to achieve the implementation of the new urban agenda and the sustainable development goals, specifically goal 11, which has to do with cities um, and sustainable communities. The second part is the recommendations to foster sustainable policies and practices in urban tourism. Uh, the first is um, urban tourism should promote sustainable practices for a more efficient use of resources and a reduction of emissions and waste within the framework of the circular economy. Uh, the second is that cities should implement the concept of smart urban tourism destinations by integrating fully the following pillars, governance, innovation, technology, accessibility, and sustainability in the three areas, social, economic, and environment. Um, cities should promote universally accessible urban tourism in line with the UNWTO. Actually, that's a good point because I also worked in countries, mainly in the global south, that only consider accessibility when it comes to tourism. It's very sad to say so, but you would find a program that's supported by the United Nations or big donor agencies or saying blah, blah, blah city or this specific city is a tourist friendly. And part of that is to make, to look at the accessibility for uh, folks who need it. But outside that city, the entire nation doesn't pay a lot of attention or invest in that. So cities should max maximize the use of big data and technology. I think that's obvious, doesn't need more explanation at this era because it helps the um, decision-making. And if you decide, and if the decision-making would engage with different sectors of economy, then it might as well look at uh, tourists. Uh, cities should develop innovative tourism products and experience and the use of technology. Um, this, is, this has been a point of debate, especially for those who are focusing on cultural tourism. But of course, it's very much encouraged because it allows tourists to understand the city more, engage with it more. What some, some of the literature argues that if you have that, you will reduce tourism because no one would need to go to the pyramids because they see it at home for the virtual reality. But there is a stream of scholars that say, excuse me, it's the other way around. When they see it at home, they would be more curious to go and see the real one, the real thing. So using the technology has been in a debate in the, in the literature. Um, cities should advance the measurement and monitoring of urban tourism in order to ensure sustainable development. I think that is, um, that's also obvious, uh, like um, this Insta observatory monitoring for how to observe how the dynamics happen, whether uh, seasonal or day and night or across different uh, seasons of the, uh, of the year. It's very important to understand that and know 
how to uh, measure and so you can do your assessment if where to direct a future tourism. My last slide is my, I have three takeaways. First, we talked about tourism concepts, question what you read, question what you hear, and even question this lecture. Tourism and urbanism, we talked a little bit about understanding the trends across time. And we talked a little bit about incorporating tourism in cities, uh, how to uh, develop successful planning for cities. I would, for the sake of time, I think I've done my 50 minutes, so I would stop here. And um, thank you very much. And thanks to Miha and all the audience. And I'm open for discussions and questions uh, from the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amir, for this presentation. It was really insightful. Uh, we have a hand up, Esther. I don't know. It was an old hand. I'm not sure what it is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, she said, I just wanted to say thank you. So. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Please uh, just either uh, open your mic and ask or write in the chat. We have a question here uh, from uh, Arshida. So what are your views on the phenomena of tourification over tourism? And how can we uh, mitigate in its negative consequences at the local level? You have a question, I think you can- Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a very good question. Um, from experience, I can tell you that this happens when the government is disconnected from the people. Well, they tend to be disconnected all over the world, but I mean when the gap increases, because the KPIs of the governor or people in central government, like the Minister of Tourism, is to increase number of rooms, number of hotels, number of visitors, number of restaurants, number of parking areas, number of buses, etc. So these KPIs are not necessarily aligned with the um, local economy and the local tribes or the local. So to prevent that, I think we, we need to empower the community to have more of a bottom-up approach to allow them to reach out, to reach up in the decision-making so they can influence to what extent we receive guests. In that disconnect, mainly in the global South, this happens. Um, I encountered an interesting experience that also would take hours to, to explain, but um, most of the global South countries I worked in has the city mayor or the village mayor and the very local government who's an ex-military government officer, which reports to the governor who's an ex-military governor and then reports to the president, which is another ex-military. The loyalty of the local government becomes more to the hierarchy up, but not the people. I encountered uh, an opposite example of that or a conflict of that when I worked in Porto Viejo in Ecuador, where the city mayor is elected. So he cares more about what the people want. And he reports technically to the governor or whoever who is actually appointed. Uh, I've seen that dynamic and I find it very important to empower local government and become more democratic. And um, yes, I hope that answered the question. Teresa, no worries. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Uh, Harshita, did I answer yes. you? Yes, she said thank you for the response. Yes, you were uh, answering uh, the question of Harshita. All right. Any other questions? You're welcome. Thank you. I have a little, very short question, please, Amir, if you could. Sure. Um, and the last part of the presentation, you were, uh, of course, linking to tourism. You were talking about the good urban governance. What are the main elements that we should consider in the good um, and a good urban governance? I, I saw efficiency. I saw different uh, different uh, points. What are the most important? Uh, 
what would make a good urban governance? Uh, empowering, I think, two things, empowering people to make decisions and give them autonomy, and also decentralization of budget. I think from a lot of my experience, all the attempts to decentralize in government has, is not genuine if you don't decentralize budget and give autonomy to give for local authorities and local government to make decisions. No matter how they reach about decentralization and empowering the local community, you can't empower local community without giving them the control and give them the budget to implement the infrastructure and make the decision that they want in their own towns and villages, which doesn't happen as much as we want. Exactly. Thank you very much for the answer. Okay. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Then I would like to thank you very much for uh, for the presentation. I saw um, other um, other people from the audience like Javier here thanking you apart from Esther for your presentation. So thank you once again, uh, Amir. It was really insightful and really uh, interesting. Uh, yes, and thank you. I added my email. Yes. In, case, in case they have any question and they don't want to, and it's long, I'm happy to. I usually do. Yeah. Yes, I guess that you would receive some uh, some emails actually, even from my side asking about certain elements. And I have uh, already had the request to share your presentation. So if you could send me the latest version, that would be very wonderful. I, I will. Thank you very much, and uh, hope to have another special lecture again with you. Okay. Next morning. Thanks very much. Bye bye. -bye. bye. Eureka. 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 Eureka.